sometime, look it up and you'll be surprised how widespread it is mm -hmm. established now. All right, two minutes and I think we have attendees coming on. So if you are Ooh. in, if you are in the meeting, welcome. This is the Gardening in the Panhandle live Zoom webinar event. And we're talking house plants today. So welcome everyone. And I think they can hear me. So let's let's test that out and see if you are in the session and you can hear me. Uh, by the way, I'm Mark Tanzig, horticulture agent, Leon County. If you can hear me, uh, type in the chat bar where you're calling from or where you're listening to us from. I'm in Tallahassee. So where is everyone else? Crawfordville. Oh, that's Pat. Okay. <laughs> Gulf Breeze, Pace. Okay, so they can hear me. Everyone else is there. Pensacola. Pensacola Bay County. County. All right, we got hey, uh, Mark Pensick. You know what they said about, you know what Bing Crosby said about Tallahassee? Uh-oh, what did he say, man? He said it's the Southland at its best. Ah, it's a pretty nice town. I do like It's a pretty nice town. It's a pretty nice town. <laughs> All right, we got folks from all over the panhandle. That's great. Again, welcome. And we are now at one o'clock or one o'clock Eastern, 12 o'clock Central. And again, my name is Mark Tanzig. I'm the horticulture agent at the Leon County Extension Office. We have a program here for you on houseplants today. So we have lots of questions that have been turned in. Uh, we're going to answer those questions, maybe answer some new ones. So we are on Zoom. We are on Facebook Live. We have a whole team of folks helping us. And some of them you can see there's a couple other folks in the backgrounds like Julie McConnell, Matt Lawler, and Evan Anderson helping us out in the background. But we have a great panel for you today. Uh, I'm going to go around and introduce folks. And we even have an amazing specialist from the mothership itself coming to us live from Gainesville. Uh, but we'll start with our local agents. So Pat Williams, you're first on the screen here. Introduce yourself, Pat. Good morning or <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. I'm Pat Williams. I'm the County Extension Director in Wakulla County. I also am the Horticulture Agent, the Ag and Natural Resources Agent, and I'm the Master Gardener Coordinator for both Wakulla County and Franklin County. Yeah. And he's, he's well, yeah, we'll, we'll just keep going. So good <laughs> job, Pat. You're holding down a lot of hats there. Uh, Stephen. Uh, good morning. Um, Stephen Greer. I'm from Santa Rosa County. I'm the County Extension Director and I kind of work kind of in a split field area. I'm through the agriculture component side, um, a touch into the, the horticulture side where I fill the gaps um, between the agents uh, and then community and rural development. Okay. And then Matthew Orwa. Uh, uh, I'm Matthew Orwa, the horticulture agent in Washington County. I'm headquartered in Chipley, Florida. And I primarily work with homeowners, commercial fruit and vegetable people, and master gardeners. And I'm going to say good morning because it's still uh, barely morning over here. And our exceptional extension botanist, Mark Frank. Hey, everyone. I am the extension botanist working at the Botany Collection um, on the UF campus in Gainesville. And I run our plant ID and outreach service that serves all the extension agents and IFAS research faculty through the state. Uh, Mark Frank is awesome to have as a resource. The great thing about extension is when you come to us extension agents and we don't know the answer, we have such a network of folks to rely on. And Mark Frank is one of those. So with plant ID, you send Mark a picture you get paragraphs back of, you know, <laughs> this is what it used to be called. This is where it's from. This is how it grows. And it just goes on and on. And it's amazing. And yeah. I really appreciate his help. Yeah. He's helped so we're, out so many times. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to talk houseplants today. Yeah. So some of you have. <laughs> <laughs> I love some, houseplants. <laughs> look how excited he is. Uh, the, um, some of you have sent us in some questions that we're going to answer, but I did want to ask, uh, start off asking Mark, uh, kind of what's the deal with houseplants, right? They're kind of like, uh, they seem to go up and down in popularity. Right now we're on a kind of a surge, it seems like. We so are on a what is it that draws surge. People? Yeah, what, what is it that draws people to houseplants? Okay, so I always think that houseplants are just like fashion. Everything goes in waves. And so the peak of houseplant popularity 
was the Victorian age when all the people from Europe were going and exploring in tropical areas and discovering all these super cool, funky plants. And then anyone who was anyone would try and grow some of these things either in a little mini glass house or if they had enough money, they'd have a greenhouse. And then in the 70s with the back to earth movement, and everyone wanted to get in touch with the earth and peace and love and macrame hangers. There was another huge surge. And then houseplants, you know, they're always hanging out, but now we're in this major surge. So if you go look on Amazon under books and you type in houseplant, there are 20 houseplant books scheduled to be published between now and a year from now, 20 in one year. And that doesn't include the houseplant journals and houseplant playing cards and tarot cards and houseplant <laughs> notebooks and houseplant stickers. I mean, houseplants are just uber hot. And one of the things that's really driving this, I think is social media. And there's a demographic component to it. So generation Y uh, and Z. So the people who are 18 to 34 are account for a third of all houseplant sales now. Mm -hmm. And houseplant sales, by the way, have more almost doubled in the past three years. So they're just surging. So even nurseries who weren't even really selling houseplants before, they've gotten on the bandwagon. They've started selling house, houseplants through their website because it's what people want. And what, what do you think draws people to wanting to grow houseplants and you know, plants inside? Well, so they say with, the, with those generations that um, they're delaying having kids, but they're wanting to make a home. There's a lot of trends like cottage core and people wanting to be cozy, the whole thing. Of, and so this all ties into it. I'm people learning so to, much, Mark. <laughs> it, no, it's a, amazing. There's whole websites. I mean, think about it. There are some Instagram feeds that just deal with houseplants that have over a million people following them. Houseplants are like one of the, there's more houseplant videos than there are cat videos on YouTube now. <laughs> wow. And that's saying something. <laughs> yeah. And this Mark, is why we you, bring Mark Frank on. <clears throat> Mark, did you watch all those cat videos first to know <laughs> that there was more? You know, I like to intersperse my cat videos and my houseplant videos. All right. Okay. So, so I got to tell you, my wife is one of those followers in one of those groups, and she shows me pictures of how big these plants are. So it's out there. And what and where it's really reflected yeah. is in prices, because there are plants that I was kind of interested in that I used to be able to buy for twenty dollars, and now you go on eBay and they're selling for three hundred dollars because there's wow. so much demand. Wow. A lot of houseplants have gone through the roof. Uh, well, let's talk, to, let's talk to, let's talk to, let's talk to some of these folks who are spending some good money on houseplants and how they can keep them alive, hopefully, because, uh, um, someone that works with me here, she worked at a local nursery and houseplants are always, you know, they, they, they had like a warranty, right. And people would bring in these houseplants that just were dead. And there was a, they had to go a little bit of back and forth before they just returned and replaced it for them. But a lot of people came back with dead health plans. So let's try to minimize that here. Yeah. Um, like so let's talk about some environmental conditions, right? Because we, as extension agents, right, we talk about abiotic and biotic problems. So let's deal with some of these abiotic, these non-living problems, and environmental conditions that houseplants like. And so actually, I'm going to go to uh, Mark Frank first. So um you know, when we're talking about light levels in general, houseplants like low light levels, but what if we have like really low light levels, what would be some good houseplants for, for those types of areas? Okay. So let me just preface this and say that all plants need at least some light, because when you put fertilizer on a plant, that is not actually a source of calories. That's just the mineral building blocks so the plant can produce its own calories via photosynthesis. And light is an essential component. So if a plant is getting no light, it is not photosynthesizing, is not producing the calories it needs to grow. And so everything's gonna slow down. So there are no plants 
that I'm aware of that grow in zero light conditions unless they're parasitic plants that tap into the roots of some other plant and there are plants that lack chlorophyll and you know or just survive as parasites but we don't have those in our house so um when you're talking low light, generally, and I think Stephen's going to talk about this soon, but often house plants are divided into low, medium, and high light plants. And examples of low light plants would be um, the peace lilies, the spathophyllums, a lot of different kinds of philodendrons, pothos, the ZZ plant, spider plants, parlor palms, um, did I say cast iron plant? Mm. Chinese evergreens. Those are all examples of plants that prefer their naturally forest understory plants. So they do well in low light, but that doesn't mean that they do well in no light. And your sign if a plant is getting too little light is if it's not growing at all, the growth is spindly, the foliage is sparse, and the foliage doesn't look healthy those are all signs that the light might be too low. Okay, and yeah, I've seen those, you know, that kind of breakdown of high, medium, low light. Uh, Steven, can you help shed light on what those mean and what's the difference? Yeah, they are, it's, it's a pretty extreme thing. And sometimes that's what gets us in trouble reversing it back out when you're coming out of the house and maybe transferring plants in the spring back out. But I'll touch on that as well. But um, when you look at the high and the, the high level, that's literally what you're thinking about outdoors or close to it, a greenhouse setting or something along that, that lines. You're looking at a minimum of eight hours up to 12 hours of light giving. And uh, that's more of a direct light, not an indirect light source. Um, now, you can create that um, by having some of the full spectrum light system set into somewhere in your house. Preferably not your whole bathroom. That'll, that'll make for an interesting experience. But um, medium light, you're looking at that four, six, seven hours of, of, the, of light required on it. And then, of course, low, um, just like, like Mark was talking about, was, was somewhere in that three-hour, four-hour range, somewhere in that, that setting. Um, you know, it's, it's a real challenge. Um, that's why you look at those low light requirements. But sometimes we get anxious in the spring and we take them back out and we set them out in the full sun and guess what happens to them. Um, they go from the, that very low light area and you'll get that scald on the leaf tissue and that elongated look that's occurred all quote winter long. Suddenly you're, you're throwing it right into the deep end of the pool to swim and that plant's going to suffer. So um, just bear that in mind when you're dealing with all these transitions. And Steven, another, you, go another ahead, Mark. thing to keep in mind is that a pane of glass alone is going to cut the light it will. 30 and 50 percent. And for each foot you move from that pane of glass, it's going to cut it another 10 percent or so. And if you've got screen on the glass or a tree or overhang on your roof, all of those things. So I finally broke down and got a light meter and went to all the windows on all four sides of my house. And what I realized is that even what I thought were my brightest windows, I barely had sufficient light for medium light plants. And you're, you're talking south, southwestern light. South and, and light. west, which are the brightest. Right. So I have a, a south facing bay window with no trees in front of it, just a pane of glass and window screen. And I was barely out of the low so it was mm. eye-opening to me. Yeah. And so you, you actually use the light meter to measure this. So this is something available I did. for folks. There are inexpensive light meters available that you can either look at foot candles or lux. And I think the table that Matt sent out via the chat shows both lux and foot candles. But the really great news in this regard is that all those people who wanted to grow like vegetables in outer space or marijuana in their basements <laughs> have fed the development of all this new indoor LED light technology. And um, just like there are a million houseplant books, there are a million types of full spectrum LED lights and they're cheap and efficient. And once I ascertained that my windows were not meeting the minimum requirements, I just snatched up all these different versions of clip-on and hanging and mounting underneath shelves, 
cheap, cheap, cheap lights. And they're so cool because they've got timers built in and boy, are my plants happy now. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just preaching the gospel of light supplementation in the, in the house. Very cool. Now, yes. speaking of speaking of meters that measure things, you know, another big important part with house plants is making sure we water them properly. And that's kind of we might want to talk a little bit more about that because watering of house plants is uh, I, I think a lot of people that kill their house plants probably love them a little bit too much with water. And so speaking of meters, Matthew or what are are those moisture meters accurate? Are those are those something we should invest in? Well, um, I, you know what? I was I did some research on this for y'all, and everything I could find about moisture meters is is about the smart technology moisture meters that are used for agriculture, and those are very accurate. But I could find nothing research based about moisture meters for house plants, and like just like the pH meters um, are not that all that accurate. I would suspect that the moisture meters for house plants are in general probably mar like somewhat accurate, but I wouldn't. Put put the bank, put the bank uh, on them. Uh, it's very easy to check for moisture on house plants. Just if you touch the the media, and if it has, if you can feel some moisture in there, it's probably not the time to water. Um, I, what I do with my house plants is I have a few here at the office, and I just feel the moisture in in that in that pot. And if it's and if it's fairly dry or dry, I'll water it. And I can look at the plant. For example, I look at the plant and if it's perky and all the leaves are straight up and it's growing well, I'm not going to water it. But then right when I start to see those leaves just slightly droop or fold a little bit, it's kind of hard to notice that that's when I water. I don't wait till it looks ugly. I just see a slight droop in the plant and say it's time to water. It'll perk right back up within an hour or two. So I kind of watch my plants to make to give them enough water and I feel that soil media to see if it's if it has moisture in it. That's what uh, I, anyone, anyone else have some good tips for when you should water those house plants? Yeah, make sure it's water and not other substances. I've got to admit, I worked with a <laughs> agent. His energy drink, if he didn't finish it, guess where it went? Right. Um, that was not a good situation. And uh, did you have a Did you have a good uh, trick for uh, when to water? You're talking to me specifically. Oh, Pat, Pat, oh, I thought oh, Pat yeah. was going to say something. Well, yeah. you know, being from the greenhouse industry. I always told my students to lift the thing up if it's small enough. Um, you know, you've got to understand the weight. And, you know, even with the moisture meters, if you've got a pot that's 12 inches deep and your moisture meter is four inches, your water all goes to the bottom and then evaporates out of the top. So a lot of times, you know, getting to understand that weight component, because you can still have plenty of moisture in the lower profile, soil profile, and it can be bone dry up top. Um, so it's, I, I would always say water thoroughly. Um, as long as there's drainage holes, I, I would tell people you could put 200 gallons through there at once. It's not going to overwater it. The, the frequency is what kills the plants if you never let it dry out. I, I agree, Pat. I've got some African violets just in little three or four inch pots. And if they're really dry, there is a substantial difference when I lift the pot between when it's just been set in a dish of water and had time to soak up the moisture. So, you know, I always figure your finger is about as good as one of those <laughs> oh, meters that you pay for. And all you have to do is stick it down in the soil. And the other thing is we got to realize there's not a one size fits all recipe for all house plants. Some like to stay evenly moist, whereas others would prefer to dry out between watering. And so it kind of depends on what type of habitat the plant originates in. And things that are epiphytes that grow up in trees like Hoyas, there used to be rain showers and drying out in between, but something that grows in a forest floor and is shaded is probably going to stay more evenly moist. So paying some attention to the habitat that that species originated in helps you to match it when you're growing your indoors. Right. This is why Mark Frank is our extension botanist. He wants you to go find where does that plant come from and use that I'll to tell help you. you. <laughs> He'll tell you. Uh, all right, so uh, Matt Orwat, uh, one of the reasons people talk about growing house plants is to purify the air in their oh, yeah. house, right? So, what are some house plants that are best for purifying the air? There's actually a lot of good information on that because Na uh, NASA 
did some initial research and now there's more and more people doing research. And it's actually true that uh, plants can remove formaldehyde, benzene, acetone, ammonia, and carbon monoxide from the air. So they can get a lot of things out of the air for us. And so some of the ones I found that do the best for um, uh, purification would be philodendrons. Uh, there's a vast array of different species of philodendrons and varieties there, um, like the Hartley philodendron. Um, there's uh, the Chinese evergreen, which is uh, Elegonema uh, is another name for it. Um, uh, and that's a nice um, filtration plant. Surprisingly, aloe vera would be uh, something that removes some uh, toxins from the air, but it's also great for treating burnt skin. Uh, Dracaena, um, there's 40 different species of Dracaena. They're also called corn plants uh, in, in, in the common tongue here. A uh, spider plant or airplane plant, um, chlorophytum genus, they, they can purify the air. And of course, your, your pistilis, the spathophyllums, uh, and I would say probably the anthuriums as well um, would, do, would, would be um, air purifying. But there's quite a few other ones, but those were the ones that kind of stuck out, stuck out in the, in the literature. For, uh, and I had to, I, have, I was asked this question before, Matt, and I was asked to look into it. And I did some research on the, some of this NASA information. And I just want to add that if you really want to clarify and move things through your house, you know, don't just rely on house plans because I think they kind of do a limited amount of air movement. Right, right. Open your windows, right? If you open your windows, you're going to get a whole lot more kind of air movement and, you know, air cycling through. So it's not on, it's not on the uh, mosquito spray night, right? Yeah, no, I'm and you know you can't do that in the space shuttle, so they got to put some plants in there to clean that stuff up, right? So, um, okay, let's move into some of our biotic problems. And I, Matt Orwood, I'm going back to you okay. first, and we can all. This is one a question I added just to, you know, so everyone can help Matt out here nice when he's done. But right. let's. Um, what are some of our common pests? You know, insect pests that bother house plants. The most common one that I've ever found would be uh, mealybugs, I would say. That'd be the most Absolutely. common one. And then I would say second in that command would be uh, white flies. And then the third one I would say would be spider mites. Um, those three tend to be the worst trio of, of problems for houseplants. I might have seen scale on a few of them, but uh, the good news is those are fairly easily treated. So if you have spider mites, I would take that plant outside on the patio and then hose it off real good with some forceful stream of water from your hose and then let it dry and the spider mite problem should be washed away at that point. If you have mealybugs or um, mealybugs or even white flies, you can spray it with um, insecticidal soap, which is specially formulated to not break down the plant's natural oils, but cause the uh, mealybugs and such to desiccate so that they dry up, they dry up after they're sprayed, and then they die. And that should also be done outside. You don't be spraying it down in your home because it could get on your furnishings. That that soap could get on your furnishings and maybe your color your furnishings or your cat. <laughs> it won't hurt your cat, but they won't enjoy it. So I would just do that all outside when you do it. But those 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 two remedies generally would work pretty well for house plants. Uh, uh, anyone else? Anyone else want to add something? I just want to say that. When I see that a house plant is having a lot of pest issues, it generally tells me that something ain't right because plants have natural defenses to insects and they also put out stress pheromones. So when a plant is stressed and it's not happy, it's getting irregular water or not enough light or insufficient air circulation, then it is going to be much more prone to insect pests. Sometimes they're unavoidable, but generally a really healthy, vigorous, vigorously growing plant is going to be much less prone to having problems with insect pests than a stressed plant. How much of it comes back to the root system and the stress on the root system? So making you know, sure just, you got it in some good media, watering it well. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. It's the whole package. It's the, you know, the light, water, fertilization, the growing media you're using all contribute to the yeah. happiness of your plant. And, uh, 
you know, the one issue like those spider mites, um, there's no predators inside the house, right, to control these things. So that's why sometimes just putting them outside for a while can uh, can help clear that up. Hey, Mark, so I don't I'll... know, do you guys have those Cuban anoles up in the panhandle? We have them yeah. all over Gainesville. So I have a couple of them that live in my house now, and I encourage them because they hang out in the sunny windows where the plants are. And I think of it as my pest pest. <laughs> control so go. i actually gave them names and, uh, <laughs> you know that i kind of encourage them because i figured that i do have a little bit of predator i don't know they're going to get the spider mites but they'll get the bigger things what you got pat i'd say the other thing is buyer beware you know once again coming from greenhouse industry these things are all grown inside or shade houses in very close proximity and i'll tell you those conditions that are great for plants especially tropical plants are great for pests and a lot of times you can just be buying them in and bringing them in. So really inspect your yeah. plants. And yeah, stay like, away from those discount racks, right? Yeah, mealy bugs can live under the soil. I, I pulled up root system and seen mealy bugs on them before and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Me too. So, you know, check your plants out, watch the bargain bin, and yeah. But the good news is with, with houseplant pests, they're relatively easy to control with non-toxic methods. And like I said, I get a lot of people freaking out over spider mites and the forceful stream of water method really works. It disrupts their life cycle and, and gets rid of them. So, um, you know, but, it's, let us know if you have some problems. We'll, we'll help you out. The other but, thing I'll say, Matt, is that, you know, we're concerned a lot about using pesticides out in the environment because of, um, you know, unforeseen affecting other things. But with a potted plant, it is often really easy to use a targeted control. So if you do have really persistent spider mites that you can't get rid of because you can't get underneath all the leaves or the mealybug or scale is really bad, you can drench a single pot and not have nearly the same environmental consequences that you would if you were trying to treat that same pest in an outdoor landscape setting. Yeah. Uh, Pat, yeah. coming to you, because there are some pests that kind of maybe aren't damaging our house plants, but they, you know, we are bringing nature inside. So sometimes we bring things uh, you know, things live in the soil that are a nuisance to us, not really hurting the plants. And, you know, one question we got was, what about these gnats that are in my soil? They're like coming out of the soil. Uh, some of these, there's a couple insects I've had uh, come into the office that they're basically living in the soil. And what can we do to slow some of these down, such as gnats, maybe springtails or another one? I think a couple of the things, and it's a good question. Um, I don't think a lot of folks know the difference between shore fly and fungus gnats. They're kind of interchangeable once they're in the pot. And, you know, we, we like to think they don't cause a lot of damage, but if you're raising seedlings and these things are in numbers enough that they're expectorating on all your cotyledons that are trying to photosynthesize, they can actually reduce light levels for young seedlings. And I, I've, I've seen some of my students' projects that they never controlled it and they were inhibited by that. But these fungus gnats that are more of a nuisance, and you know, there again, if you're in an office, you don't want to be swatting them while you're trying to type, but their larvae eat organic matter. And your potting mix, which is the basis, is, is peat moss, is organic matter. Well, one of the quickest ways to do away with some of these things is to control your frequency of watering. Um, once again, back to my earlier statement, when you water, water thoroughly. The folks that will go through and water their plants four or five times a week and give it just a little bit of water on top, you're always keeping that top layer moist. And that's where the adults come in, lay their eggs, they hatch out. And for the most part, they can feed on roots, but they're feeding on that peat moss. So what I tell people is curb your overwatering, let that top good half inch plus dry out. Now, if you've got something that you just really can't, well, a lot of times you can just scrape out the top inch of soil, be careful with some of those upper roots, and then just put a dryer, you know, type in. Um, those will work more often than trying to do any drenches and things like that, is just change the environment, let them dry out, and those larvae, and then the adults will just magically disappear. Okay. No chemicals. Good advice. Uh, all right, moving on to some propagation. So, Houseplants, kind of a fun thing about houseplants is we can share them with friends 
Uh, who wants to take on this is one I just threw in there too. some general propagation. We'll go to Mark Frank, maybe general propagation of house plants. I know that each one might be specific, but what do you yeah, got for us? What are the real specific. easy ones? If it's got a stem, then a lot of people will take um, stem cuttings and just stick them in a glass of water, right? Like that pothos there. Yeah. Yeah. But that pothos and and they'll just root them in water and then once they've formed roots then they'll pot them up in soil know that roots that form in water don't function quite as well in terms of anchor and moisture absorption they have it kind of easy when they're in water so it takes them a while to adjust once it's moved into soil um, I do a lot of propagation at home and I just have little pots and recycle the old six pack trays that you buy, you know, vegetable or flower seedlings in. And I'll just put nice um, sterile potting media so you don't really want to use soil from your yard. It's not very well drained and it's often not sterile. It's going to have weeds or pathogens. So a, a nice bag pasteurized potting medium in those small containers and just take small cuttings. I think a lot of us want to take a big fat long cutting, but it is going to be harder and slower to root relative to a cutting that's just got a couple of nodes and is maybe, you know, three, four inches long. And when you see what the professionals are doing in the production nurseries, the foliage, you know, production folks, they're, they're doing massive amounts, but with small cuttings and trays. Okay, so I always tell people not always sitting it in the water, right? That only that it doesn't work all the time, and yeah, not everything. Some things root easy in water, and some just rot. And it yeah. also depends on the time of year. So I've always got something in a jar of water, but I'll tell you, in the in the heat of summer on the south side of my house, that water in a jar gets too darn hot, and those cuttings all rot. But at this time of year or the spring the water temperature is better in those same windows and I can easily root things. So it depends on the time of year and how warm it is and whether your house is air conditioned or not and the angle of the sun. Steven, you I got just, something just, to add? Yeah, just um, uh, don't follow my dad's practice with that. He had jars all over the house, different window <laughs> settings, and then he'd forget about them. You know what happens to the root system then. You have that nice looking brown water with roots and then uh -huh. he tries to plant them. So um, there, there is caution on that. Watch your time that you're allowing those plants to stay in the water and, and get some rooting in there. Um, uh, Stephen, your my mom and your dad are in the same club. My mom has <laughs> things that she has been rooting in water for seven years. <laughs> has it bloomed yet? Is the question. You know they look terrible. <laughs> uh, a question just came in. I don't know that came from Facebook or where, but it was actually the question I was just going to ask next. They ha someone has a leggy fiddly fig uh, and it sounds like maybe based on what you said earlier mark it maybe because it's not enough light why it's so leggy but i think pat i was gonna ask this to pat what would be the best way to propagate this fiddly fig and let me tell you if you figure out a good way to do it go look at the prices of those fiddly figs at the nursery holy and you will want holy. to be propagating fiddly figs that's right we should all be propagating <laughs> what you got pat how do you do it? how do we do it all right so kind of just you know backing up a little bit um, fiddly fig is not a low light plant. And as Mark was saying earlier, you know, if that's things four feet from the window, even though it's might bright and sunny, if you don't understand foot candles, a foot candle is the amount of light one candle gives on a, a surface one foot away. And when we're growing in a greenhouse, we're shooting for that 4,000. We actually shade it because a sunny day in Florida is between 10 to 12,000 foot candles. That light coming in your window, even over there by my pothos, is maybe five, 600 feet. And I'm three and a half feet away from that light. And on my desk, I might have 35 foot candles. So Mark is right, it goes down so fast. And, so and you're fast. talking about a tropical tree that grows in that 10,000 foot candles. So first thing I would say is maybe be more selective in what you bring inside because you're just setting it up not to do good. LED um, indoor grow lights. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think Mark's going to have his own brand of LED grow lights here pretty soon. I'm, so, I'm a convert. So anyway, now that we, we have the question, we have a leggy plant. Um, I'm the first one to tell you that um, you plant plants that are not doing well. You can't always expect a brand new, better plant. Um, the plant was in ill health and you're just trying to take something 
And, and really, you're trying to get it to grow roots when it's, it's barely hanging on. So I would caution you with that one as well. Um, I, I won't tell you what I used to tell my students, Mark, but it was something like plant crud, get crud. So uh, here we go. For fiddle leaf fig, which is a ficus, um, generally air layering works best. And, and the whole advantage of air layering is, and there should be uh, you know, something in the chat there for a reference, is you try to get it to grow roots while it's still attached, and therefore you're not severing it from the root system. Um, some of the things like ficus Alaska, a rubber tree, and the more woody stems like the, the ficus lorata, fiddly fig, they, they take a long time. Um, make sure it's kind of that normal growing season. Don't try to do it in fall when, you know, tropical plants are shutting down. Better to do in spring when they're doing that. So really look it up. There's different methods. And ultimately, what you're going to try to do is um, you don't want it to be very, very woody when you're trying to do this. So more toward the tip. I would take a good maybe, you know, 18 inches on the tip, air layer that. Once it's rooted, you are going to cut that off. And then you might even want to cut your fiddly fig down even a little further above a leaf or a node and that way, and then give it more light. Um, we used to, we had rubber trees in our greenhouse at the medical center in New York, and I would climb through the rubber trees and air layer. And I got really good at it. I, I could also be like the Velcro suit and stick to the wall when I was done. But uh, just, yeah, air laying is probably the best thing. One of the things you will want to get is some rooting hormone. And those come in different percentages. And for something woody like that, you wanna be looking for something like a 3% or an 8%, which really is about 3,000 to 8,000 parts per million. So the, the common rooting hormones like root tone, I know we're not doing product endorsement here, but a lot of those that you find in the store are 1% and they oh, may gosh. not be enough to, to trigger good rooting on a woody specimen. So that would be my advice. Okay, that's so, some good so advice. And this, this specific question, um, going back to what Pat said, I think that fiddly fig might be a candidate for rehab, like maybe going out to a nice, like shaded porch and getting like more light and a little more regular water and maybe in the springtime resuming fertilization. And then when you start to see some active growth and some signs of renewed vigor, that that would be a better time because to try to propagate. yeah unless it's a total you know salvage operation where you're like oh my god i'm gonna lose this thing i'm gonna try and get a cutting so i'm gonna have to spend 500 dollars for a new one <laughs> uh okay let's see we're gonna move on to a little bit of maintenance activity mark, if, if marks if the other mark's gonna pay 500 dollars, i'm retiring and gonna start a ficus farm here so <laughs> well I, I mean i've seen these prices at the store i'm and telling I was like, you they are moly. out of control yeah uh, it is confusing with two marks on it, but I'm mine is spelled properly, right, Mark Frank? Incorrect. <laughs> All right. Uh, so maintenance activities. Uh, let's see, Stephen. I'm going to go to you. And okay. how do you go about selecting a good potting mix when you're repotting your house plant? That's the magic question. How <laughs> do you? You know, because when you're looking at, and I do recommend, like Mark had mentioned earlier, is going with the soilless type mixes. Don't go with the, don't, well, I shouldn't say don't, but be careful if you're creating your own and you're using some type of soil and other things with you. You're bringing a lot of issues that can be long term and move between a lot of situations. So I, I really look at, um, I, you're looking at a percentage of peat moss, um, the, the pine bark levels, typically a fine pine bark. Um, you don't want to go too large on the size. And then you're looking at a perlite vermiculite type mixture. Um, and it's going to do, really depend what those percentage mixes are as what you're trying to do and where you're growing and how your watering practices are and all those things. Um, the size and diameter and depth of pots, all those things, where you're going to have moisture collection issues and challenges um, are the drain holes appropriate for what you're putting in there. Is that big rock you put over the hole hoping it wouldn't plug it going to really work? <laughs> You know, the, all those things. <laughs> yeah, we've done it all. You know, we've that. all done it. Who's got a pile of broken clay pots to put at the bottom? <laughs> oh, that's block. a big no no. That is a big no no. Yeah, tell so, us. You know, we'll get to you next, Mark, about that. <laughs> so that you know, you're you're looking at water holding capacity. What's your natural habit is? Are you an overwaterer, underwaterer? Like Pat was talking through. As long as you got it draining through, that's the 
the positive point. You've got to keep movement through there. But the other side of it is, is what's in the pot with the pH levels and requirements of plants. Um, what What's already pre-mixed fertilizer-wise? Is it slow release at a certain level? Is it three months? Is it nine months? And all those this things. Is one of, this is one of these big, it depends answers, right, Stephen? Uh, yeah. Did I say that? You didn't say it, but you should have. Yeah, yeah. You should have said it right at the beginning there. And and I've got to admit, when I'm looking at the bag mixes, I'll, I'll wait for one that's broken open to look at one of those bags, check the material in it instead of just yeah. going with the description. And we so, did put a really good link in the chat there. And I think on Facebook Live, you got it as well. But yeah. there's a really good uh, uh, kind of website on the University of Florida webpage, the IFIS Extension webpage on how do you go about picking that mix for the certain plants, you know, cause there is a lot right. of variables that get into it and you do want to match it to the plant. So, so generally the most expensive component in a potting mix is going to be that peat because it's a limited resource. And so people have tried to move away from using peat based mixes just because it is a finite resource, but I'll tell you, it grows plants really well and you will see everything from the 99 cent special bag of potting soil to the 1399 bag of potting soil that is called professional. And often what is the difference between them is that there's gonna be a higher proportion of the more expensive ingredients in the more expensive bag and there's gonna be more composted wood in the less expensive bag. And I'm not telling you never to go for the 99 cent bag, but I know from my personal experience that when I invest in a professional potting mix, I generally have a healthier, more vigorously growing plant because it's really formulated yeah. for professional growers to get results in a finite period of time so they can bring it to market. And let me add yeah. that uh, coconut core is a great alternative to peat. I've used that several times this this last couple of years and had great luck with coconut core soils uh soil mixes or potting mixes yeah this is this is all about what you're willing to front up to put up front with your expenses when you're starting into it don't cut on the front side it'll get you on the back side and that's true with landscaping out outdoors everything what are you Mark, doing where that root base is going Mark Frank, you want to talk about why is it that we shouldn't put those big chunks over the holes? So um, in pots, you have a natural drain that um, is, is gravity fed, basically. And as Pat mentioned, the water is always going to go to the bottom, right? When you have a dramatic change in particle size from the finer particles of your potting media to those big chunks, of broken clay pots or gravel, it actually impedes drainage and actually causes water to collect at the interface, which means then you're creating a really favorable habitat for either the growth of fungal pathogens or for those little fungus gnats to lay their eggs and have their larvae hanging out. So this is really a cool thing about a good yeah. natural draining situation. And most of our potting media have perlite and they have a particle size to facilitate good drainage yeah and this is a really neat thing about soil physics that kind of blew my mind yeah. when i finally got my head around it but it's really neat it's also, also influenced by pot size so if you have a plant that dries out readily using a shorter squatter pot you're going to have a higher amount of water in that saturation zone at the bottom of the pot versus a deep tall pot. So you got a succulent plant and you want to ensure remains well drained. You would want to do a taller, narrower pot. You got something that wants a lot of water. A shallow squat pot is going to be better for that. Yep. So I just send all the rocks back to my dad's house is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mark, um, I've got a spare question here if, if the other Mark's okay with it. Sure, what you got, man? Um, the spare question is if what if you I like to collect some antique pots. So what if I have these old antique pottery pots that don't have drainage holes and I can't drill them because it would break the antique pot? What do you do with that? How do you manage that? Yeah, what do you do with pots that don't have holes? Are those desirable at all? Who wants wow. to answer this one? Mark, Pat, Stephen, take it. The whole so darn hard. Yeah, but the whole interior scape is predicated on that. You, you don't have all your big planters in the malls leaking all over the floors. So, you know, basically with that, you know, Matt, I'd say, you know, put some gravel in the bottom and then put a drain pipe like a piece of PVC, put some gravel or some window screen over the 
the rock in the bottom to keep the peat base mixed from intermixing, and then just run some PVC down with some notches in it, and you can just stick a siphon down there if you really wanted it. But so, yeah. so Matt, uh, what a lot of the orchid people say in terms of water is that you drench and drain. So they'll actually take like their moth orchids and put them in their kitchen sink and flush them with water till the running, the water's running freely from the bottom of the pot. They'll let it drain. Then you can put it back in that cash pot that doesn't have a drainage hole and it's going to be just fine as long as you've allowed it to fully oh, drain and idea. stink and so the, I do that myself with certain plants where I put them in my kitchen sink to water them once every seven to ten days let them sit there for half an hour after they've been drenched drain and then they go back in that pretty old pot without the drainage hole they're in an ugly black plastic pot That's but then they just go idea. back in the pretty exactly yeah I'm gonna do that I have this beautiful antique pot that I wanted to use okay thank you uh, look at that. We it was changing lives here. Okay, Pat, I got a big question for you. When should we call it quits and throw the stinking house plan away? When should, no. when do we give up? <laughs> when do uh, we give up and just toss let, it? Let's, let's mute Mark so he can't interject here. <laughs> uh, you know, I always tell people the reason I became a horticulturist versus a vet so I have no problem with throwing plants away. <laughs> you, know, it, you know, it's a reputation thing. If my plants don't look good, then people don't think I know what I'm doing. So I'm not going to keep something <laughs> scraggly around. Now, oh, I Lord. also realize there's a lot of sentimentality when it comes to plants. This was a cutting I got from my aunt. She's passed away. All those things like that. I would just say, you know, first of all, you got to look at the age of things. Um, don't wait till a plant is going on you know, that's last leg to try to propagate it. If you start to see that it may be toward the end, propagate it earlier versus, well, I've got one leaf on the 17 inch long stem that's hanging down. <laughs> I'm gonna to try to propagate because it's not going to work. Um, you know, other things that come into play, back to what we've been talking about. I'm sorry, but you may just not have a good environment. <laughs> Um, oh, I thought you were going to no, say you may not have a green thumb. Sorry. Well, no, no, no. But, you know, so, but go to markfrank.com. He has, these, <laughs> you know, LED light sources that he's selling. But, but if you don't have the right environment, it's never going to look as good as it came from the nursery. And guess what? The, the interior plantscape, they, they base this on resale. You know, you will never think you're the person that's kills your plants. But if I sell you something that will never survive in your house, I know you're going to be back in a year buying more. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, hey, I've been in the production side. I know all these things. And so with that, give it the best you can. If you're not being successful with certain plants, do what Mark said, get a light meter, find out what you're really working with. And then, uh, as Matthew was saying, go to those lists. And Stephen, find those plants that are in that range. With the 20 new books coming out and the 6,000 that are already out there, it'll tell you that light range to do that, and then you're better. But other than that, I'm, I'm a tough sell. If you don't like it, it's not looking good, it's full of bugs, out of the house, because it's, it's just going to infect everything else if it's yep. got a disease or something like that. And um, no, I, I've got my pride. I'm not going to have. Yeah, not to mention the level of frustration when you're trying to keep that plan around. You know, it's just, you will spend more trying to take care of it than, well, unless you're going to buy that $500, you know, fiddly fig, but, you know, get a new one. Start, you know, we, so, we have to put dogs down, we get puppies. So yes, we start a, all over. a different perspective on this same <laughs> situation. A lot of plants aren't really that happy being in indoors 365 days a year. So I always say my plants are just like me. They like to go on summer vacation. So I have a shaded carport and no car. So my carport gets filled with plants in the summer months and they all go outside and they get high humidity and they get bright filtered light and they get fresh air. And then in the fall, they start moving indoors and they have, you know, they stay inside and cozy and warm. But it is amazing when you can have a plant that looks pretty gnarly and then you move it outside into a situation where it's getting some good fresh air, some regular water, some bright filtered light, and it's um, plants want to live. It perks you know, right up, they, huh? But there are, aren't we talking about carport plants now instead of house plants, Mark? <laughs> yeah, but, but to me, it's just a continuum. <laughs> I live in a big city like Tallahassee. I put my plants out. Somebody takes some, you know, it's not safe like Crawfordville. You know. <laughs> I, will, I will tell you, um, um, Dr. Ted Bilderback years ago, 
he he made this comment and it was it was very relevant. He said, remember anything plant, landscape, interior, exterior, it's a living, changing thing. Don't be afraid to change. Right. Um all right, let's get to some specific plant questions. And we will start. Mark Frank, this one's for you. Uh, indoor orchids, what are some best practices for keeping those stinking things alive inside? Okay, let's just talk reality here. <laughs> Good, I'm the glad. The majority of orchids that are in cultivation are epiphytes from tropical habitats or subtropical. And they're used to super bright light and excellent airflow and year round heavy rainfall, which is very hard for us to duplicate indoors. So honestly, I can only recommend one kind of orchid for as a house plant, and that's the Phalaenopsis, the moth orchid. And fortunately, there's a gazillion and one hybrids from little dwarfs to big ones in all different flower colors. And there's continuous improvements in the breeding, but Phalaenopsis are pretty darn foolproof. I would say most other orchids, dendrobiums, um, a lot of the other things, the people who are growing them as hobbyists are usually are growing them in, they've got like a sunroom that's got a glass roof or they've got special circumstances or they've got the bank of grow lights from markfrank.com. You know, they're doing something more. When you see someone who's growing an amazing diversity of orchids indoors, they're going to have fans and humidifiers and supplemental lights and all this stuff, which most of us just don't have the pockets to be or the patients to be able to deal with. So I say stick with the orchids that can deal with your average indoor house condi conditions, which is those moth orchids, the Phalaenopsis. Yeah, they're pretty think, bulletproof. Mark's really right there because I bought this giant Catalea from the Texas a and plant sale when they were thinning out their greenhouses. And uh, I tried to give it to my parents to grow and it was dead within a few months. And, <laughs> and it was gorgeous in that greenhouse. But it, of course, it had that humidity, that high humidity and light that it liked in that greenhouse. Oh, Matt, here's a good question for you, actually. I got this. So uh, several people asked about Christmas cactus. And uh, someone asked, are there any house plants which have blooms during the winter? So I kind of gave away the answer. But Matt Orwa, you're on mute again. But unmute yourself and tell us what you got. The Christmas cactus is good because it, it'll uh, and there's a little um, there's actually a little document there that's that's been given for that but um it needs to have some cool some uh, not cool weather but the the light the, the the short short days for it to bloom but but uh, uh there's a lot of of plants for example that will bloom if you time it right for the, the winter time you know your spathophyllums lots of different plants will bloom um you can always get the the amaryllis bulbs you know and 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 you know, pot them up, and 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 they will bloom for you, or you can, or you can force them to bloom. Uh, so there's there's some things you can do for that, but um, you know, uh, Christmas cactus is the most popular one. I would say, you know, sometimes it's just the luck of the draw. If you have a plant that that's happy, it'll bloom when it wants to, and sometimes it'll be. These are mostly tropical plants. If you if they're in the house, you have to research if they're if they bloom based on daylight length or if they just bloom in a cycle because a tropical plant most you know is it, it would have a constant daylight no matter what it'd be this the 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 seasons would be the same so wouldn't necessarily depend on on that but some other plants that are not necessarily tropical you know would depend on that that's that's my answer i'd yeah. like to put a plug in here for the humble poinsettia which yeah. you know used to be a crappy plant, but there has been so much improved breeding and there's hundreds and hundreds of cultivars. And I am so impressed now when I buy a poinsettia and I'm selective in buying a healthy plant that's got new bracts emerging, I can put it inside nowhere near a window. And as long as I keep watering it on a weekly basis, it's going to look good for two to three months without any light once it's formed those bracts. So it is a great way to get really nice bushy color indoors in those winter months without yeah. having to do the light input. Because once yeah. they form the bracts, they seem to hold them. Yeah, that's wonderful. And also, I would say some of the new coleus with all the different colors that coleus are putting out. They're, yep. They're, I, I tried the coleus last winter, but I found they kind of resented um, the lower humidity of the heated indoor environment. So they were a little more challenging. 
And, and Pat, I have a Christmas cactus related question for you. Uh, it, it deals with repotting one. They have a huge Christmas cactus and they want to repot this thing, but the limbs, you know, the, the little branchlets keep falling off. Is there a good way to do this? What should they do with those little, those little pieces that fall off? What, what suggestions do you have for them, Pat? Well, I think one of the easiest things, and, and we did this as well, uh, if you go to the store and you get that poinsettia as marked a spot, usually they come with a, a sleeve on them. And so that keeps it, you know, protected during transit. And the easiest way is just to get a funnel sleeve that's open on the bottom, whether it be pa paper, I prefer paper sleeves versus the plastic. And what I would do is I would just start working that sleeve up from the bottom and then all the branches and everything would go up and they would be supported. At that exactly. point, you can try to go ahead and remove it from the pot. Um, you know, do this, you know, back in spring so that anything that does break off that you have the capabilities of propagating. You know, don't do it, you know, a month after bud's been set or you're trying to get buds to set um, in, in the holiday season. But do it in spring and then do that, repot it, give it a little bit of fresh substrate in there. And then as you take the sleeve off slowly, um, anything that does kind of break on the outside, you can use it for propagules. Very cool. See, look at that. We just had a cool question come in. They have a poinsettia outside. Uh, is there a way to force it into getting those beautiful bracts? Who wants to take that yeah. on? Anyone? It's, well, it's a short day plant or long night. Basically, it has to do with phytochrome breakdown and all that kind of stuff like that. So as long as you're giving it a, a long night, that five to eight kind of, you know, inside the house or outside the house. Um, if you're living in a place that gets, you know, 14 hours of light a day, you're not going to get them to change colors. So in the poinsettia producing nurseries, a lot of times they actually have curtains that they pull so they can get it dark before it's actually dark outside. And so they can get, because they want to bring them to market before our day length is actually short enough before we've had daylight savings time. So it's challenging outdoors to get them to color up in times for, for the holiday. You usually need to do some manipulation. And particularly if you've got outdoor lights, you know, if you've got um, lights that come, motion sensor lights or those kind of things, that can throw off that required um, long night that is needed for BRAC formation. Yeah, the, um, it depends on the size too. If, you know, if there's a way of fully covering it, on a literally at a sunset, keep those that long night hour. That's what you're looking for. Is is it a, just like I threw out a pressure washer box the other day? I thought it's kind of neat keeping that, but I really didn't have any space for it. You know, would that fit? Maybe because you do get a just like Mark was talking about a lot of light bleed coming from things from you know the street lights to literally people driving in and out of the neighborhood and brights on and all kinds of things. And it really disturbs the whole night for them. So you've got to figure out a way to manipulate, and cover that, that side. If it's short enough, put a dark trash can over it each night. Yep, yep exactly. That's like the old term of taking it to the closet, closing the door in there and keeping it in a, a dark space. Yep. Uh, I have a, we didn't, we have a couple of questions outstanding. We got about four minutes, but I want to ask this one of Mark Frey, because I think this is a good, this is a really good question. So there are, and we get asked this sometimes. So there are some plants that are on the invasive list, right? That we are not, we should not be recommending. For example, mother-in-law's tongue, Sansevieria, uh, Stingonium, or um, let's see, what do they call Stingonium? Something foot. Anyway. Arrowhead. 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 Yeah. Um, these are plants that are known to be invasive outdoors. They work really great as house plants. So, you know, is there... Can someone wanted to know, can they safely have one of these, you know, invasive plants as a house plant? Sword fern, actually, another good example. Well, so I um, think their question was actually inside a screen pool. That's enclosure. right. Yeah. And so yep. one of the questions they asked about was the invasive sword fern. And the spores on those nephrolepis are about 30 microns, which means that they can easily pass through your standard pool screen mesh. So I would not recommend a sword fern, an invasive type, the nephrolepis cordifolia on a, on a uh, pool enclosure. The other things you mentioned, generally 
what's the risk of them escaping if they are staying inside the screen enclosure, particularly because those are often paved surfaces, so you're not necessarily talking about things rooting into the ground. I don't see what the problem is because I don't see any chance of propules like fruit being dispersed through that screen. The problem sometimes is that people grow things like syngoniums as house plants and then they get tired of them because they're looking crappy and they don't want to throw them away like Pat would. They want to hang on to them like Mark would. And so they put them outside and then they root it in the ground and next thing you know they're up in the trees and the whole neighborhood's gone. So you just got to say okay if I'm going to grow this thing that has a potential invasive risk it's not going outside of this enclosed space, be it your house or your pool enclosure. Yeah, that, that's always my concern with them. Is someone grows them, they look poorly, and it's kind of how we get all our invasive fish species, right? Someone like feels bad, they don't want to kill the thing, so they it's free you know, willy. You got to subscribe thing, right? to the Pat Williams School of Disposal. <laughs> right. Um, so you know, say a mother-in-law's tongue starts looking bad, they throw it in the backyard, and before you know it. You know the little back area where you threw it is now covered in mother-in-law's tongue, and now you have a now you have a problem on your hand. So, this far um, north of the Panhandle, would that be the case? Because it's if we get cold enough, I think. I know someone who has one that stays outside in a pot mm -hmm. that overwinters and has done fine for a couple of years here. So, um, it's got an, it's in a special spot. Uh, I do want to uh, let everyone know we're right at about a minute before two o'clock Eastern time, but there is a survey. Uh, if you could please click on the link in the chat and take the end of session survey, that would be very helpful to us. We thank you all for being with us. I am going to keep asking questions if everyone doesn't mind. Uh, just a little, just a couple, because we have a couple of, of questions left. There's a plumeria question and a um, fruit tree question. So we'll, uh, we'll ask those and get those done quickly. Uh, Julie is also reminding me that we have another, the last gardening in the Panhandle Live is in December and it's gonna be on selecting and maintaining trees. So that's a very relevant topic for the winter time because that's the best time for us to be planting trees up here in North Florida. So that's gonna be a good one. Um, so take our survey, please. Uh, check us out at the next one. And as we're leaving here, I want to ask, let's see, I want to ask uh, Matt Orwat, uh, Plumeria. Someone has a Plumeria indoors and they want to start a new cutting is what it sounds like. How often does the plant bloom and is it hard to prune and start a new cutting was the uh, specific question. Uh, you're muted. Plumeria Matt. Yeah, is yeah. healthy. You should be able to, uh, it should be able to bloom periodically from uh, spring through fall if it's healthy. A lot of times they, they don't want full sun. If, if you have them outside during the summer, like they, they prefer to be uh, during the, the warmer weather, they don't like full sun. So you need to have some kind of shade. Um, but if, if you're propagating plumeria, the thing to do is make sure you have a piece of a branch of the plumeria that has actively growing stem on the tip and then cut several inches of that stem maybe five five to well actually you could get all the way up to 12 12 to 15 inches long actually and and then let that stem after you cut it off let that stem harden for uh five days okay before you plant it and then what you're going to want to do after you let it harden at the base, uh, harden off dry, you will take that cutting and stick it in a pot of pre-moistened soilless media like a peat perlite mix. And that, that, so that, a per, that a soilless mix has been pre-moistened, you stick that cutting in and then you're not going to um, moisten it any further. It, You'll, you'll sink, sink the base into that cutting of about three inches deep and then do not water it for the first five to six weeks while it's developing roots. And then once you start seeing new leaves develop, then you can water it again. And most of the time they recommend chopping off the, 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 leaf, the old leaves on the, on the stem and getting rid of those uh, when you propagate uh, the plumeria. Plumeria, that's a beautiful plant. Yes. Uh, so... Uh, but they need special care, you know, when you're growing a plumeria, you need to, I don't know, it, to me, in that case, if, you're, if you really want to grow plumeria, you, 
you it needs uh, it really needs you need to research the optimal light level for it because you can have too much light or too little light, and you really need to research that optimal light level for the plumeria. And up here, you're gonna have to bring it inside. You know, ideally, you have it outside in a container, mm -hmm. in that right light condition, then bring it in for the wintertime, like Mark and his his carport full of plants. Um, for vacation Mark, for plants. Mark Frank, last question of the day is going to go to you, and it is on overwintering fruit trees, specifically mango and avocados. So, uh, folks okay, are trying so to grow we'll, in a container. You know, I, hey, I just feel like I am the reality check guy. We That's okay. what extension folks do. That's what we have to do sometimes. Fruit trees are full sun plants. You know, they are wanting at least six to eight hours of direct full sunlight, unencumbered sunlight. They generally are not well adapted to being indoors. So if you've got a mango or avocado and you just want to move it in for three days to get through that period of time where the temperature is dipping super low, you can move it into almost a no light situation and move it right back out after the cold, the cold wave has passed and kind of deal with that. But most of us with fruit trees, they're in big containers. They only want to move it once and have it for the winter time, the entire winter time indoors. And that is very challenging to do without supplemental light. One way that you can slow the pain um, is to acclimate that plant. So it might be moved um, on a fully sunny, patio and you might move that pot to a partly shaded location to acclimate instead of moving it directly indoors. This is something that Jeff Williamson, our, one of our fruit extension specialists, is recommending for moving potted containerized fruit trees indoors is to kind of give them an acclimation to lower light conditions and they're not going to thrive and flower and set fruit for you indoors. But hey, the name of the game is keeping them alive, right? Because no one's supposed to be growing a mango on the panhandle. Avocado, that's kind of a different ball of wax because there's some improved breeding in avocado, particularly out of University of Texas where some of these cultivars are taking 18 degrees Fahrenheit without a problem. But a mango, that's pretty darn tough. So yeah. I say go to markfrank.com, get those, <laughs> those banks of grow lights. And, uh, you know, I got to start this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there that. really isn't a markfrank.com. There really so is I not. Know, folks. And I am not self-promoting. <laughs> uh, um, I'm telling why, you. Why we were here, I, I went in and I got that domain registered. Uh, uh, so Mark, if you want to use it now, you're going to have to buy it. It's going to cost a lot. <laughs> Um, all right, folks. I got a $500 well, fiddly fig I'll give you for it. Um, well, thank you, panelists. Thank you, folks who attended. We just got a really great comment on our end. I don't know if everyone sees that, but uh, Sherry, you're most welcome. Thank you all out there in Zoom land and Facebook Live land for joining us, because if you didn't come, we'd stop doing it. So thank you all for joining. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. There will be some information that goes out, I believe. You'll be able to see this later and, you know, uh typically we check in our garden in the panhandle live uh website there usually is a recap of this so you go there in a little while you'll see a little recap on house plants and again i thank you all for joining us thank you all to the panelists thank you mark frank for joining us from gainesville this was and, fun yeah this was fun so we'll get you back and do it again mark um Sounds good all right extension agents have a great day and do have a great afternoon everyone out yep, there everybody everybody enjoy day. House plants make great holiday gifts. Oh, look at him. Markfrank.com, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. More plants. Shipping and handling will be extra though, Mark. You know, like <laughs> All right, okay, see everyone. You. Take care. Bye-bye.